Um, it's 12 and 13 that to me really make this document invalid. Uh, because uh, in saying number 12, we have Jesus that says, you know, all of the, the different um, disciples ask him, well, who's the best of us all? <laughs> Which actually does happen in the canonical gospels. Um, but Jesus basically says that in Thomas, in this <laughs> Thomas, he says that when he is gone, that his followers should follow James the just. And that all of heaven and earth was made for James the just. I mean, wow, okay. Jesus never says that about anybody else. Um, <laughs> not that we know of. Sorry, it's hard for me not to laugh here. Now, who is James the just? Um, there's a lot of debate about this. Now, some scholars uh, would say that he might have been the son of Alphaeus, right? We know that within the disciples, there were two James. There was James, the brother of John, um, and they were the sons of Zebedee, okay? And there was this James, a uh, son of Alphaeus. Um, some, again, tried to say that this James, son of Alphaeus, who was also called James the Lesser, is also known as James the Just and James the brother of Jesus, right? Because in the Bible, um, Paul, both in Acts and in Paul's letters, in Galatians, Paul references uh, James as one of the founders of the church, one of the pillars of the church, and specifically the Lord's brother. Now, of course, Catholics like to say that, well, he didn't mean brother as in son of Mary. He meant, you know, like brother as in maybe son of Joseph for a previous marriage before Mary, or maybe cousin. Um, others have said no in Greek. That's very clearly the word brother. Um, I don't want to debate that, but needless to say, um, James's family uh, or better, Jesus's family comes up in the canonical gospels, but they're never listed as disciples. So unless we take that to mean James, son of Alphaeus, uh, but again, he was also called by other names. So again, why would you call James, if he was supposedly the brother of Jesus, why would you call him James the Lesser? Um, that doesn't make any sense. It probably is uh, James, the relative, if you will, of Jesus that is mentioned in both Acts and Galatians as being um, pretty, he initially defends in Acts, he initially defends um, Paul in evangelizing to the Gentiles because there's actually discussion in Acts about whether uh, the message of Jesus should be brought to the Gentiles and Paul fights for that. Um, and then uh, the community in Jerusalem that is led by James uh, becomes more and more conservative. So even though at the beginning the decision is made during the book of Acts not to expect the Gentiles to get circumcised, um, in Galatians there's already, Paul actually confronts Peter because Peter comes to visit him, but then uh, distances himself from those that are not circumcised, basically because of pressure from other followers of James. Um, and this comes up in Paul's letters to the Galatians. Um, and I bring this up because if, the, if, if this text of Thomas, if Jesus had actually said this about James the Just, many other things that are in the document, in these sayings, the Gospel of Thomas, basically say to disregard many of the... Um, Jewish laws of fasting, of circumcision. There's a specific reference to circumcision in uh, saying 53, where Jesus said, it's not important. It's important for you to have a pure heart. Um, and so why then would this all important disciple, according to this particular saying, right? 12, that's a big statement. Why would this individual then after following Jesus, then go back on all of that to become uh, more conservative and expect the Gentiles to be uh, circumcised and expect the Gentiles to follow the same dietary limitations as traditional um, Judaism. Um, 
again, it contradicts itself. So this is one of the big ones for me that tips me off to the fact that this person, whoever wrote this, probably knew that James the Just was an important church leader, which he was, according also to, again, that first generation after the death of the apostles, that first generation, Papias and, and, um, and uh, Justinian, or Ju Justine of uh, Rome. There, there were different, there's a whole list of them. Um, all of them mention that, of course, James the Just was the leader of the church in Jerusalem until he was martyred, until he died uh, for the belief, um, for the faith. And so why, again, would, um, why would James become, why would James go against things if James was the most important person, why would he go against things that Jesus said? It's as if a person, the person that wrote this, had heard that uh, about this person, James the Just, who was this leader, and was not aware that even though, yes, he probably is a relative of Jesus, if not his brother, I think it's probably his brother, um, he, he was not officially one of the disciples until after the resurrection. Um, that would suggest to me that, again, we're dealing with someone who heard the history of the church, not completely, but had heard some of the things and some of the names uh, and wrote them down later on. Not an actual follower of Jesus that was present at the time of uh, the ministry of Jesus and the crucifixion. Another way that we know is saying 13, um, that has a sort of discussion between Jesus and, um, and Peter. And Matthew, and we would assume that the reference to Peter and Matthew, Matthew, who is not really referenced all that much in the canonical Gospels, that this is probably with the fact that whoever wrote this document was aware of the Gospel of Mark, which is attributed to the teachings of Peter that John Mark wrote down, um, and the Gospel of Matthew. Because the description, Jesus says, okay, well, who do you say I am? Well, well. You know, Mark says you're a messenger, and then Matthew says you're uh, a philosopher or a teacher. Um, and that could be sort of giving us sort of a, a summary of the way Jesus is sort of depicted in those Gospels, uh, according to this author, obviously. And then it's Thomas, in the end, that is the one that knows all of the secret sayings, according to saying 13. Um, <laughs> But again, this is sort of a sign within the document that it's a later document this person all knew about the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of Matthew. Um, again, some other uh, specific sayings that come out of this. Um, it's really, it comes down to, again, we have uh, one that's strange, that is number 42, um, which without any context is actually kind of hilarious. And it's this, uh, Jesus says, become passersby. <laughs> okay, what does that mean? <laughs> um, again, it could be that he was meaning, that he meant um, not to be too attached. Uh, to this world, okay, I mean, I can accept that, but it's a strange statement um, without any context. Um, there's another uh, that, that specifically, again, calls the, to, to the disciples to not be like the Jews. Now, if to be not like the Jews, you mean don't be like the Pharisees and the Sudeces, who were strongly um, against the ministry of Jesus. Um, maybe, but even then he was willing, even during his lifetime, even knowing that they were against him, he went to the synagogue, he continuously brought his teachings there, he would speak to certain Pharisees, I believe it was Nicodemus that came to see him um, at night. Um, so certainly uh, Jesus spoke to the Jews and initially had intended his teachings to be for the Jews. Um, and then with Paul, we see the evangelization of so many um, others in the world. And, and John alludes to this as well with certain conversations with Samaritans and with Romans. Um, but overall, in the Synoptic Gospels, we have an idea of Jesus attempting to bring his ministry to the Jews. So, again... Um, 
it's not terrible, but it's it's strange considering the other things that we know. We have we have passages that are similar, like saying twenty, which is the faith uh, the size of a mustard seed that can move mountains. That similar to other passages in the Synoptic Gospels. Um, and then you get to the later sayings, which just get stranger and stranger. Um, <laughs> there's one saying, gosh, the saying about um, the, the lion, don't be eaten by the lion. Uh, blessed, blessed is he who eats the lion <laughs> because the lion will become human and blessed is or cursed is he who is eaten by the lion, uh, for the human will become a lion. Now, the author that I read with his commentary tries to equate this um, to, um, to other passages where the devil or, or Paul writes where he tries to make it out like the, the our enemies, quote unquote, um, are, are those that would try to shake our faith. So um, the lion of doubt that will uh, eat you or should be eaten. But even if that were the case, it wouldn't make sense in this particular saying. Um, the man who eats doubt, the doubt becomes man, okay. Um, but then if the, if the man is eaten by doubt, the man becomes doubt, maybe. I mean, again, it's a stretch. It really is a stretch. Um, you have um, the ideas about, oh God, there's the one about the, um, the lost sheep, which is, it's almost hilarious, uh, number 107, where instead of having the idea, the same idea that we have in my favorite story, the story of the prodigal son, um, but of course, Jesus uh, tells this story in different ways. He tells it with a lost sheep. He tells it with a lost coin. Um, this idea that Jesus has of, re of finding those that were lost, right? Of those that had moved away from God, bringing them back to God, which is a beautiful idea. Um, and in this, in the Gospel of Thomas, instead, basically the idea in Thomas is that that was, that was the favorite sheep to begin with. That was the best sheep. The best sheep got lost. Then uh, you find the sheep and the shepherd says, I love this sheep more than all the other sheep. But I mean, we have the idea that the shepherd already loved that sheep more. Um, it, it misses the point of what the story was trying to tell. Um, the point of salvation and being happy when you find someone who you thought was gone. So the final uh, passage is the one that is the most controversial. Um, it's also the silliest, but it really reflects um, ideas that in Eastern thought about yin and yang and masculine and feminine. Basically, Peter uh, says to Jesus, well, why is Mary with us? She's a woman. She's, you know, again, we've talked about what first century Judaism thought of women um, and what the Hellenistic world thought of women. Um, so it would make sense. But Jesus's response uh, was, well, don't worry. Her soul will become a man, right? Her soul will become a man. You don't need to worry. Um, by salvation will transform her into a man. And of course, that doesn't mean, you know, with genitalia, it really means the, the esoteric idea of masculine and feminine more than it does a physical transformation. Um, and this is echoed in other Gnostic works, um, like the, uh, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, where Mary receives uh, secret teachings about um, Sophia and about um, the secret knowledge and all these things that come up and she has an argument with Peter. Oh, uh, the, author, <laughs> the author tries to link this to uh, sayings, um, statements by Jesus on uh, divorce. Um, I believe it's in Matthew 19, if I'm not mistaken, um, where uh, Jesus talks about how, well, the author tries to link it to the section where Jesus talks about um, chastity and abstinence, okay? And that some, some are born eunuchs, some become eunuchs, and then some choose to live as eunuchs. Um, and that's 
the best way to be, basically he, he says that it's best to abstain from sex if you can, um, with the implication that if you can't, then get married, but stay married, uh, because it was very clear in the Bible that Jesus was against divorce. Um, yeah, so again, um, I think that it would be surprising to many people to realize uh, that Jesus was against uh, divorce, but he was. Um, but overall, certainly a passage like this goes in contrast to all the wonderful things that Jesus did. And um, I, I, it's, it's sad to me to think that so many people consider this document better than the canonical Gospels. Um, we are so lucky to have um, the canonical Gospels. We are so lucky to have um, the actual words of Jesus. Um, and statements like, oh, well, her soul will become male, it undoes, um, it goes against um, all of the, the efforts that Jesus made um, to be, to involve women in his ministry, um, to make women um, equal in the eyes of the law, or at least to have equal access to salvation. Um, so in that way, I'm not going to say it's offensive. It's just sad to me that so many people would prefer this sort of document to the beautiful canonical gospels that we have. Um, so to sum up, um, I do not think that this can really be attributed, um, to anyone within the first century, within the, the initial period after, uh, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. I just don't believe that. I think that dating this at 50 AD just doesn't line up with what we know about that period of time. It probably was written in the mid to late second century um, by someone who was not familiar with the original teachings of Christ. Maybe someone who had um, access to some knowledge uh, of the Gospels, maybe a translation of the Gospels or had heard them somewhere and kind of mixed in some Greek philosophy. Um, it's, um, it's very similar to the kinds of quotes that we see from a famous person like uh, Marilyn Monroe that then turn out not to be actual quotes from Marilyn Monroe, right? That happens all the time. Um, and so I think that um, in closing here, um, and I'm going to have to break this into two parts, I think. <laughs> um, in closing, like I said, to me, this is um, overhyped fan fiction. Um, it's interesting. It's interesting to know it exists. It's interesting to be able to make the comparison. Um, to me, it only strengthens my faith in the original four Gospels um, and how true they are. Um, but again, I would encourage, I would encourage anyone who wants to know more to read it. Um, you'll have a good laugh. There are different, uh, versions of it that you can find online. Um, I will leave some links, uh, in, uh, the description. Um, and with that, thank you so much and God bless.